The topic of genetic diagnosis in LGMD, I think, is something that needs more attention, and especially genetic diagnosis. Patients with mild cases of limb girdle muscular dystrophy, and, and by mild I'm speaking relatively, even the mildly affected individuals have significant impacts on their lives. But th those patients are sometimes harder to diagnose if they may not as readily get genetic testing or their genetic testing may be less, uh, may yield less obvious results, uh, at least on the first go. And it's not always recognized that a lot, a lot of limb girdle muscular dystrophy patients uh, don't get a genetic diagnosis after a clinical testing. And so more work has to be done to improve the precision of genetic diagnosis. I do think of this as a virtuous circle in terms of diagnosis and therapies. When new therapies are under development, that motivates patients to try harder to get diagnosed in terms of uh, going going to diagnostic facilities and seeking subspecialty care. And it also motivates healthcare providers to try harder to find these diagnoses. And then once you have more patients diagnosed, that provides more of a uh, of a base uh, for these therapies because the more patients that we can find, the more we can justify developing these therapies. So I feel that uh, diagnosis and therapy are really two sides of the same coin. How do we best serve our patients? And so, so increasing precision of genetic diagnosis is really important for limb girdle muscular dystrophy. Where diagnosis becomes so critical is, again, in that patient that clearly has a syndrome suggestive of a limb girdle dystrophy, but we haven't been able to determine that genotype, you know, and that could be uh, because they have a mutation that hasn't been described before and is still exonic or a part of the DNA that we routinely tend to assess with these first screening tests, or it could be because they have a mutation that is in an area that is very under in, interrogated in the typical approaches. If you have a deep intronic mutation, for example, that's certainly going to be missed by a traditional next generation sequencing panel and also by exome sequencing most of the time, unless they know to look for that particular change because it's been described in other families and has been built into the platform of exome that you're using. And so as we get into these even more um, uh, broad and new age uh, techniques, things like genome sequencing or um, RNA sequencing, looking for the transcription that's going on in the cell and whether it actually is making the amounts of transcript that we're expecting of different genes. Um, these are novel techniques that help to elucidate where that person's um, dystrophy may be coming from. And then we can then further hone in on that region um, to truly find the pathogenic mutation. It always helps to have a family where multiple people are affected so that we can compare those who have symptoms to those who don't and find the areas that are in common with those who are symptomatic. And then it also helps to have multiple areas of the world where these phenotypes have been seen so that if you're seeing a consistent change across populations, you can be much more certain. Uh, but to be able to determine these kinds of mutations takes international collaborations with large volumes of genetic data that are being, inter they being interrogated by very specialized labs um, and, and researchers. And so um, these um, ongoing efforts are so important to both getting the right diagnosis for a person in terms of knowing what to do for their best management and, and uh, counseling of their family and everything else that we always strive to do in the clinic, but also making sure that we're really targeting their intervention to personalized medicine where we really know exactly what we're attempting to treat and what the best combination of treatments might be for that individual relative to both their genotype and where they are in the experience of the disease when we start to treat them. Mm -hmm.